Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Forage Focus for the uh, 2021 season. And again, we are here to do this online and appreciate everyone joining us here today and to be part of the Ontario Forage Council. This is the first of three web webinars for this year's virtual conference. Because it is a webinar, although you can see and hear our presenters, we cannot see or hear you. If you have any questions, please type them in the Q&A feature and Christine O'Reilly will share them with the presenter at the end of the talk. Thank you to the Dairy Farmers of Ontario, Noon Forage, Steelhead Egg, ANL Canada, Ontario Sheep Farmers, Kemen, and AgriSolve Inc. for their generous partnership of this year's webinar series. The webinar will be posted on Ontario Forage Council's YouTube channel, so feel free to subscribe to be notified when the conference videos are posted. If you're on social media, please use the hashtag Forage Focus. Today's webinar is brought to you by SemiCan and Clean Fix North America, Inc. Today's session is called Minimizing Losses to Get the Most of Your Silage. Our presenter, Dr. Renato Schmidt, has a dairy and beef cattle farm background and is originally from Brazil, where he obtained his Bachelor of Science and Master of Science degrees. He moved to the United States to earn his PhD in Animal Sciences from the University of Delaware with Dr. Lyman Kung Jr. and worked in numerous experiments evaluating the effects of different additives on the fermentation of forage crops. He's authored and co-authored 16 peer review manuscripts, 32 scientific abstracts, and 47 technical articles. Dr. Schmidt joined Lalamand Animal Nutrition North America as forage product specialist in February, 2008. At this time, I'd like to turn it over uh, to Dr. Schmidt. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Uh, first of all, thanks for attending this webinar. And I would like to thank the organizing committee for the invitation. Just introduction, some basics. Uh, the silage is an aerobic process for preservation of forage crops of adequate moisture content. So you see that's underlying some of the most important or the most important characteristics for the ensiling process. So the next is the presence of soluble sugars. This is the fuel for the fermentation. So we need some substrate for the bacteria to produce ideally lactic acid. Lactic acid is a very strong acid that's going to help to pickle the whole forage mass. But this is a very heterogeneous, a very uh, complex environment, especially in terms of microbiology. So other fermentation acids and fermentation products will be produced. I'll be discussing about the presence of air in the forage mass since it's a primary factor that negatively affects this effect, this process. Uh, we talk about anaerobic fermentation, so air is, will be the worst enemy. And finally, the outcome of the silage fermentation is determined by the dominant microbial species. So ideally, as I said, we're trying to have that lactic acid fermentation, but it could go like several different ways. One example is uh, this study that was done uh, at the University of Delaware by Dr. Lim Ming Kang. And this is a chrono plot, so it's just how to show the diversity and the proportion of different bacteria species. And it was done in high moisture corn after 30 days of ensiling. So we had two treatments, the control on the left and Lactobacillus buchneri 4788 on the right. So when you look at this diagram on the left, we see all these different species of bacteria. And the profile or the fermentation was kind of messy, so it was a little bit of everybody. <clears throat> now, the one that was treated with uh, Lactobacillus buchneri 4788, 95% proportionally of all the population was El Buchneri. So it just shows how the bacteria it was applied and how it dominated the fermentation. And when we checked the presence, it was there. And uh, I'll be focusing a little more on the losses, you know, just to get the most out of your silage. And the losses during this ensiling process is not really a novel topic. Uh, this is some uh, information out of the K-State Ag, Ag College Bulletin, number six, all the way back in 1889. So they stated that 
7% dry matter loss of ensile whole plant corn silage compared to the fresh weight at the time of ensiling, described as evaporation. So this has been going for a while, and just a note, in 1889, they're having 7% of loss. That's huge. That's excellent to be on the single digits. And I say that because when we look at this more updated graph, the potential loss during the, ensiling, the, during the phase of ensiling, you know, they can get out of control and it doesn't take much. So if we look at this, uh, the bottom uh, bars here, they're in the light gray. That's under good management. We have all these different phase of ensiling, direct ensiling, field curing, respiration, harvesting, also during storage in silo respiration, fermentation effluent, and top spoilage and feed out in the end. So we have three, five, four, one percent total loss is thirteen percent. So this is pretty realistic, pretty average what I see, you know, in the real world. Now, if you have not so good management, something about planted to be too mature or too wet, something goes wrong. You see that the numbers, another 3% here, 11%, 13, 18. So they start like piling up, you know, just this snowball, it, it starts to grow really, really fast. Then if you get rained on, or even, you know, there's still like a lot of people that don't cover their silage, especially at the feed yards. Then it's basically you expose everything to oxygen, to the elements, and really the sky's the limit. And when we talk about the ensiling process, we try to retain the most of the dry matter and nutrients. So there will be losses, as I said. So we have to really try to make it minimize them as much as possible. Uh, first of all, we have to start with a high quality forage to end up with a high quality silage. And of course, have good level of management. But uh, on this graph, uh, when I was in grad school with Dr. Kung, we just had uh, different dates to harvest tree kale, and we observed the effects of maturity of the plant. So we see that when you start advancing the maturity, the crude protein levels decrease as expected. And, you know, most of us, you know, we all know about it, but then there's kind of a trade-off. So we get more tonnage, so we get more yield. And in this case, it was represented by the plant height. And thinking of plant height, the plant needs more like a structure from the fiber portion from lignin. So the total NDF content increases as well. However, the digestibility of this fiber goes down. So we're going to end up with a lot more material, but then the quality goes down and it, it, it depends on the goals of each property. Sometimes people, they just want that scratch factor and you know, that's fine. But if you're looking for a material with a high TDN, with a high digestibility of fiber, also high crude protein, then we have to harvest during the vegetative stage of development of the plant. Uh, with corn, it's a little different. We all know that because of the ears and the grains and the starch accumulation. So uh, this is something that I, this is an interesting data and match some situations that I've, I've been in Mexico when I worked there. So uh, this is from Nev Thomas when he was at the Minor Institute in uh, New York State. People, in, uh, when I went to Mexico, they would harvest immature corn, wetter, and the explanation was, well, we get more water, we got more weight, and no, it's more like a proportion of these different nutrients, including water. So when we look at this 29% versus 34% dry matter corn, the yield was the same, but then when you look at the starch accumulation, the grain development, you see how much energy we will be missing here on the 29% dry matter corn. Now, we talk about the maturity, but then we also have to work that specific range of dry matter, and it's a little different for some forage crops. In this case, I'm going to focus a little, you know, just more on the haylage in general. Uh, this is some data from the Cumberland Valley Analytical Service. There is this range of dry matter, different small ranges here. It starts with 24, 28, really wet, all the way to 52 plus. And on the y-axis, we have the amounts of total acid, lactic acid, acetic acid, and butyric acid. So when we think here on the weather side of this graph, what happens? We have a lot of moisture in the system, 
there's a lot more of microbial activity, extensive fermentation. It takes a you know longer just to pickle and stabilize everything. So we have more of a you know messy fermentation profile. A lot of acetic acid produced. We got the risk of clostridial fermentation with the high butyric acid, and this is just like a nasty fermentation overall. And the total acid is pretty high. Now we start moving to a desired dry matter range between 3640. Some people they like to go a little drier, especially if it's we talk about tower silos and some regions they are really susceptible to, to clostridial fermentation, so they like to go more on the dry side. But still, the lactic to acidic acid ratio, it's between 2 to 1, 3 to 1, virtually no butyric acid, and a, you know, a good amount of total acid, so you don't have to worry about uh, some depressed intakes or anything like that. Now, you go to the other side here at 52 plus on dry matter, uh, the lack of moisture restrict the fermentation, you know, both from the, the fermentation per se and from the undesirable microbial activity. So less acid will be produced and needed for uh, uh, preserving the crop. But the problem is during packing, we have that material that's drier. It's going to be hard. It's going to retain a lot of oxygen that will be trapped in the forage mass. So this will lead to more plant respiration, aerobic microbial activity, molding, also some protein damage, just that smell of that sweet tobacco or burnt tobacco. So we try to be, of course, that range 3640, maybe a little higher depending on a particular circumstance. Now in the corn, we know that a lot of, you know, most of the energy it's in the kernels on the starch. And we've been talking about processing, the kernel processing for a while. So this, this slide is a, it's a little old, but it's still, I still like to use this set. Uh, those are two sets of samples, quarter pound that fresh corn unprocessed and cor fresh corn that was kernel processed. The one that was unprocessed, we can see easily here all the kernels, the whole kernels and the process. We have to really look for like one here in the corner, um, maybe the, no, another piece somewhere here, but they're really nice picture. You know, then th th those are 43 whole kernels for unprocessed and seven processed. But the really nice picture is the next one, and also it's one of the joys of grad school. So some people will understand that. We had to get some of that manure, you know, from the source, wash and make everything nice and visible and clean. So in the unprocessed, we see a lot more of all these whole kernels and all this, you know, energy that was wasted. And in the process, we saw, you know, a lot less of these uh, whole kernels. And nowadays, we're talking more about the fecal starch, how it's important just to have very little and the animal will convert that either to milk or meat. So now it's just like in a general number, we try to be, you know, about 3% of fecal starch. We change gears a little, we're going to start diving a little more on the uh, ensiling and the effects of uh, the fermentation and the effects of air, since it's the worst enemy of a silage, as I said, and that's because on the front end, on the beginning of this process, you delay the fermentation and also this plant respiration, this microbial, aerobic microbial activity will use the nutrients. And during storage and feed out, it will stimulate the growth of yeast. So the spoiler yeast, they're the culprits of basically 99% of all heating events leading to excess heating in the silo and the feed bunk as well as the spoilage. Some losses during pre ensiling uh, most because of respiration. Plant respiration always has to be accounted for, so it's the same as the microbial respiration. What we do? We use nutrients, energy to produce water, CO2, heat, and free ammonia. So we literally just burn some nutrients to stay alive. Now, each 18 Fahrenheit increase in temperature, it's related to an increase of 1.7 dry matter losses. So this picture that I am showing right now, it was taken in a, in a dairy in Michigan. I think I was waiting for the nutritionist and they were just delivering, you know, just dumping this alfalfa in front of the silo, but there was nobody pushing or packing. Then I went there, I checked, I grabbed a, a couple of handfuls. 
I can, you know, we can see that it's kind of like burned out here in the middle. The outside is still nice and green. And when you look at the uh, thermal image with the infrared camera, right here in the core in the middle, it was 118, 119 Fahrenheit. And on the outside, that's more like a purple and reddish temperature that was pretty much ambient temperature. It was 78, 79. So virtually a 40 degree increase in temperature. So this is easily what? Three and a half percent, maybe four. And it's one of the things that are just, you know, it's, it's management. So I understand there's a lot of, you know, conditions that are out of our control, especially with, you know, weather elements, etc. But in this case that, you know, we have to have somebody just to keep this process moving. And the next slide, you know, just explains more look on the research setting. Uh, older piece of research, again, out of Dr. Kung's lab, the amount of water soluble carbohydrates or soluble sugars decreases steadily and the amount of dry matter loss goes up. So this is the fuel for the lactic acid bacteria to do the proper fermentation. And if you start just waiting, waiting, we're not going to have enough. And not only we have dry matter losses, we still have another problem. You see, it's just, it just keeps compounding. Uh, this is the population of fungi, yeast and molds on different bars. And the hours, again, 6, 12, and 24 after, uh, before uh, packing or filling the silo. There's a jump of one log from 0 to 12 hours. And this is a tenfold increase. So each log is a tenfold. And 12 to 24 hours, another tenfold increase. So right here at the, uh, hour zero, we're about, I don't know, 600, 500,000 of each of them. But then 24 hours later, we're at 60,000, 60 million actually. So instead of this issue, <laughs> we're facing this issue during siding, plus the lack of oxygen, uh, lack of substrate, and the increased dry matter losses. So some basics for the packing density. Spread the forage, progressive wedges, thin layers, max six inches, pack tight, continuously drive throughout all the surface, covering all the surface. Use the uh, heavy tractors, add more weights if necessary, slash on the tires or fill them with water. And this is a really nice, you know, quick and dirty calculation. It's based on the delivery rate. So the tons per hour is multiplied by 800 and then gives an approximate packing weight that you need. So for instance, just to make life easier, I put 100, 100 tons delivered per hour times 800 equals 80,000 pounds of packing weight. So this sometimes might be a little, when you have like too much of a large operation, might be a little tricky. If you could do like two separate piles better, but then uh, when you have too many packing tractors, then it's not really feasible, and then you start increasing the risk of some accidents. In the end of the day, we're looking for that 44 pound fresh packing density per cubic feet or 15 pounds dry matter per cubic feet minimum. Uh, this is one uh, picture I took on a feed yard. I think I, I don't remember, I think it was Kansas or Nebraska. And uh, they were packing some uh, 3D kale, and I asked, you know, do we have enough packing weight? So we look at all the semis, there's one, two, three, four, five, and I couldn't take the odd picture of the other semi, I didn't have a panorama setting. And packing tractors have one, two, and three. So <clears throat> the way this forage is being delivered, they really think that it's being well packed, properly packed, and on, on the top of this, how much of a traffic, how much traffic we see there, how much of uh, problems with, you know, increased risk of accidents. So that's another thing we have always to think of and never forget. And uh, this is a nice graph. It's an older graph and it, it's pretty much like the only one that we've seen. And it just represents the proportionally inverted, you know, relationship between packing density and dry matter losses. So we increase the density and the dry matter losses decrease. And again, we're always looking for that 15, 16 pounds dry matter per cubic feet. This is some uh, some data again from Kurt Ropo. 
The University of Wisconsin Extension website that's here on the bottom, they have many, many different spreadsheets, calculators, and this one <clears throat> that I found interesting and I want to show it's about the uh, figuring out the packing density. So we input several different parameters. And in the end of the day, in the end of the spread, uh, the calculation, we have this predicted dry matter density. And in this case was 15 pounds dry matter basis per cubic feet. So very nice. There's for the construction of piles, all types of silos, etc. Now I decided to play around with some of these parameters. So when we looked here, I changed the uh, delivery rate from 120 to 180 tons per hour. Uh, the layer thickness from six to nine and the total packing weight from 80,000 to 60,000. Now what happens to our packing density? 10.8 all the way from 15.1. So, you know, it, it just doesn't take much to drop considerably the dry matter density. <clears throat> And as we can see from, again, Ruppel's graph, that drop represents, you know, a solid 4% in dry matter losses just because of that increased porosity. Okay, we covered, huh, no pun intended, we went through a packing and now let's talk about covering. Always, always cover as fast as possible. This is such a classic picture uh, from the late Dr. Bolson. And on this silo, they didn't cover. The, here on the top is the original three feet, you know, what was the surface. And at the time of the experiment, pretty much the top 18 inches became seven inches of all these, you know, it's, it's lime and dark and nasty material. And the original bottom 18 inches became 15 inches. So they even follow up on this silage study to a feeding study with the beef steers and just including 5%, 5% in the diet of this silage this nasty material, it was enough to drop the intake of the steers by 1.3 pounds dry matter per day. Also decrease the fiber digestibility by seven points. So the, you know, blending, the loading, sometimes not always the solution. Uh, this is another piece of data out of Bolson. It shows different types of forage crops. They were both uncovered or and covered with the regular polyethylene plastic. They are, uh, and then they, they evaluate the losses at 10 inch, 20 inch and 30 inch on the top. So the first, it's about the uncovered and we see at the 10 inches with the red bars virtually all crops, they were about like 80% of losses, 80% gone because they were not covered. There's still some, you know, consider considerable losses, especially at 20 inches. And, you know, of course, the deeper you go, less losses we'll have and lower loss at 30. But then we compared the regular plastic, especially the 10 inch top layer to the other one, and we see the difference. So we might have like average, uh, except on, or, yeah, except a little more on corn, but they, they were averaging what, like 20% of three of them instead of 80. So it's four times less in terms of losses of that top 10 inch layer. So again, always cover. Uh, some general recommendations, you know, the thicker plastic, the better would be more of a barrier for the oxygen transfusion. Uh, white plastic better than black. <laughs> yes, sounds like a no brainer, but I have to mention that uh, oxygen barrier fumes. I like the technology. I have some data that I'll show that as well. Consider using two layers of plastic. Uh, it's OK, but could it be debatable again. <laughs> I'll show some data or some pictures. And finally, put more ways on the seams and edges. Like on this picture, we see we have splits all over. They're pretty, pretty nice, pretty decent kind of big pile. But then you see all the whole tires at the seams and the edges. Uh, this is the effect of black versus white plastic on the temperature of silage. This is on the six in the top six inches, and it gets as much as like a 20 degree difference. So the plastics, you know, the regular plastic, you got the white face, and the other side is the black face. And sometimes I've seen like the white side facing down and the black side facing up. 
that just absorbing a lot of that uh, the heat from the sun and it shows the difference here in temperature. So again, always use the white one and facing up. Now this is just some data just to talk about the different types of plastics. Uh, the study didn't have a negative control that was uncovered, but still we look at, we can just focus on dry matter recovery. And here we can see the difference. The one that was with the regular plastic had a 90.6% of recovery. The oxygen barrier plastic, the original, that first brand that was in the market, it was nine, a little over 95%. And there was uh, oxygen barrier plastic like, you know, another competitor, another alternative, and it was 93.8. So at least in, numerically, the original oxygen barrier plastic was higher. And I, what I really like about the technology is not only the higher block of the oxygen, you know, blocking the oxygen transfusion, but it's such a clean type of film. It's, 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 it's clean, it's like thread wrap. It just sits really nice and you will eliminate a lot of those uh, air pockets. And when you use the regular plastic, and sometimes they even have like fused with some oxygen barrier, so it's a little thicker. And it's, you know, it becomes a little harder just to eliminate those air pockets. But still, you know, pretty nice uh, recovery. And from that Bolson study, it's, it's more than an valid of an investment. Uh, the double plastics. So this is what I meant. Uh, the producer here, I think, was not there in Idaho. He used, we can see here, the two sheets of plastic. Uh, covered with the splits, everything, you know, looked nice, I think, in terms of covering, but they were still pitching a solid what foot of a crust or spoilage. And I imagine the reason for that is that they didn't have a, a proper, I don't know, packing job in the end for some reason, and there was, there was still quite a bit of air that was trapped, and that air led to plant respiration, aerobic microbe activity, molding, and all that spoilage. So it's again, it's all those phases that are really important. You invest a lot on the covering side, but then the final packing job was not ideal. It still had some porosity. You know, we end up with that top spoilage. Now it's going to dive a little more specific on this fermentation and the microbiology. And, you know, again, this is a it, it, fermentation microbes and microbes do all the work. Basically, that's how it is. And when you bring the plant from the field, it's colonized by a wide array of different microbes. And these are the most prevalent, the most common ones. So we have the good guys, the lactic acid bacteria. They're dividing hetero and homofermentative. But we also have the bad guys. And believe me, there is a, this list should be a lot longer, but those are the main players. So we got the fungi, the eastern molds, Enterobacteria and uh, Clostridia. Why we talk about this homolytic fermentation, homofermentative fermentation? Well, the reason for that is that the microbes, they're going to use the simple sugars that have six carbons, such as glucose, fructose, and produce two molecules of uh, three carbon acid, that's lactic acid. So this dry matter recovery in theory it's 100%. And not only we have a really nice, you know, process, efficient, lactic acid, as I said, is a very strong acid. So you lead to a quick, fast, and sharp drop on the pH. And that's what we want. We want the fermentation fast and efficient. <clears throat> now, the heterofermentative LABs, they are, uh, they're, they're good bacteria, as I said. They're beneficial. They're just not as efficient because they produce some other compounds, you know, that have two carbons like acetic acid, ethanol, and we're going to lose a little bit in terms of CO2. So it's almost 90% of the uh, theoretical dry matter recovery compared to 100. Now we go down to the yeast and molds. They're going to use our lactic acid, that's a preservative. They're going to use the residual sugars, glucose, and yeast, they, pro they produce ethanol, CO2, also water. And the uh, dry matter recovery is about half. So we lose a lot of material and not the most undesirable one. There is some energy value in this, but then it can also lead to residue in the milk. <laughs> How about that? So we, 
it, it's been shown in sugarcane silage down in Brazil. So there, there was a residue in the milk. Wake up, have a glass of milk, and you, you're ready for the day. Uh, Clostridium fermentation, they produce some, you know, a lot worse end products, such as butyric acid can lead to uh, ketosis, some other metabolic issues, and also uh, biogenic amines. So they also degrade a lot of uh, amino acids and producing compounds such as putrescine, cadaverine. So when people say that a clostridial silage smells like death, that's because it really does. And then, you know, not only thinking about, you know, the loss, we just talk about dry matter nutrients, and we're not talking about nutrient, re, uh, dry matter recovery, not only nutrient recovery, issues with animal intake, production, reproductive traits, metabolic issues, etc. And using an inoculant, it's a recommended practice as well, it's another step, another tool in the box, and this uh, table here shows why. We have all these different research institutions that we did some research studies, corn silage, haylage, uh, barley silage, and when you control the dry matter loss, we, co we compare dry matter loss from control and treated, there's always a positive outcome. So like uh, Dr. Rich Muck used to say when he was at the forage lab in Wisconsin, we can always make a good fermentation better. You can always get on the dry matter retention and nutrient retention as well. Now, this first study at London University, the difference was just 1.2. <clears throat> so it's, uh, well, it doesn't sound a whole lot, but hey, we go a couple of rows below and it's 8.2. So the magnitude of the response will vary. And at the same time, we don't know what type of microbes are coming from the field, especially in challenging conditions. If you're later in the season, then we have more of a fungi population instead of lactic acid population naturally. But in the end of the day, the overall average was 4.7%. And even if we go conservative, 4%, what does that mean? Okay, how much is the value of a, a corn silage per ton? And that 4%, okay, what is worth? And the ROI on the inoculant use is it, it's it's pretty easy to figure out. Uh, the previous slide was about those front end losses. So during the active fermentation, this one is a little different. This is with the Buchnerai technology with our LB4788, and those were losses during feed out. This was a farm scale study done with egg bags, four egg bags per treatment, and corn silage down at the University of Florida. And first we see the difference dry matter losses. I think even like less than half of the dry matter losses for the inoculated corn silage. So another 4.4 points that you're not wasting. And what's neat about this study is that they also check the nutrient value or nutrient losses. In this untreated corn silage, not only we end up with less material, but also with the lower quality. So there is a high losses of crude protein, high loss of gross energy, about, you know, at least like a fourfold of each. And the reason for that, it's again, our, you know, our friends, the spoiler yeast. So in the control silage, they were about four and a half million CFUs per gram. And the treated silage, it was just 13,500. Uh, this is just some uh, some more pictures just to talk about aerobic instability. And, you know, we all know it's something that happens. It's, it's real. Uh, this egg bag here was at the uh, University of Delaware Farm at the dairy. And we can see there's like a little mold patch right here on the top. And maybe there was some oxygen that was that got trapped or channel that stays there. And when you look at the infrared picture, there's 57.7 degrees right here in the middle. And right there at the uh, moldy patch, it was 105. So almost a 50 degree difference. And oh, there's just a little, a little piece here. But remember, when you talk about molds, there's something that you see, but there is also all the mycelia that goes down and it spread like for a larger amount of the, uh, of the top here. And that's one reason like, you know, we people recommend like, oh, you see that your uh, your bread got molded, you know, and it's just a few slices that are molded and 
some there look clean, they are not really clean. You still have some, you know, a reasonable amount of mold in there. Uh, the second set of pictures, this was taken at Derry, Minnesota, and they were just going through half of a pile, fitting out to come back and go to the other half. And we look at this picture and everything looked like straight and clean and well, it doesn't look that bad. But then the infrared camera just brings that, you know, that visual aspect of the silo a little differently. The face that's being refreshed and renewed and fed out every day, the temperature was about 72, 73 degrees. And right here on those, on the other two faces that were exposed to air, it was around 92. So it's a 20 degree difference. And sometimes producers say, so are we just gonna, you know, get a slice and throw that stuff away? Well, the little slice, oh my goodness, it represents a lot of wagons. So it's not just a little bit of uh, spoilage. So it's something quite considerably. And again, it should, it should, it should be milk. It should be meat and not just, you know, some type of fertilizer. Um, this is, this has been like a hot topic lately for the past couple of years, the uh, use of drones. And I see, you know, more, I, I had more than once people ask me, so what do you think of the drones? Well, I think it's a great technology, but it, you know, if you're not packing your silage well, or even covering and you ask me about drones, you have to work a lot more on the basics to start going all the way up there. So it's, you know, as I said, the, the, the exciting process, the whole thing, it's, it's, it's simple. It's, I'm not saying that it's easy to manage everything, but those steps are simple, but we have to cover that basic, you know, the basic uh, management points. And still, we have, uh, there's a, this company in New York State that we recommend some of the producers. We kind of do like a bridge between them and he shared some of the data and i really like this uh table here on the top that's per day as fed rate in tons monthly so we look at the 90 84 84 96 95 and all of a sudden 114. so this is a good act 25 tons a day extra so uh, i asked him well what happened here and then he said well what happened it was pretty much this situation here that I mentioned. There was a pile that they went halfway and they needed just to throw away whatever was spoiled on the side that was exposed to her. 25 tons per day in a whole month. So that's what, 750 tons that you just, you know, uh, threw away. So this is, you know, this is a lot. And it, it's one of the things like we, we can do, you know, better, maybe split the piles to try to control the inventory, the feed out rate, you know, something to avoid this type of situations. Uh, always be attentive to the feed out rate. Uh, this is a nice uh, graph. We see the feed out rate, you know, they recommended minimum six inch a day right here. Dry matter losses based on the bulk density. So remember, I said, you know, ideally you should have 44, 45, pounds as fat per cubic feet as bulk density. So it should be something between the red and black lines. <clears throat> and if we follow this all the way here to six, we'll be still slightly below, we'll be below that recommended max dry matter loss of 3%. So again, we'll try to follow the uh, packing density, also the feed out rate and uh, there will be a little bit of losses, but it, they will be under control. They're not just going to skyrocket. Now, just to ruminate over some economical impacts of silage losses, uh, as I said in the field, I've, um, it's not hard to see losses at 15, 20% really. If we reduce a five point percentile, this would represent savings of $30,000 per 10,000 tons of silage assuming 60 bucks a ton fresh matter. So it's, I'm not sure how far I am from your reality, but it's just some numbers and we can just, you know, just adapt from that. Now, not only we have these losses or savings, depending how you see it, if these are losses, this five percentile to replace that, remember we have to replace that if they're lost. 
these 500 tons lost, they would require 390 tons of 86% dry matter shell corn. And I did this calculation with the help of Mike Hutchins per TDN equivalency based on the NRC. So not only going to lose that, you know, what's worth $30,000, but then, oh, we need to buy another almost 400 tons of shell corn just to replace the nutrients. So in summary, always pay attention to the details. Always pay attention and the silage fermentation, it, it can be a very uncontrolled process. The basic management recommendations should always be followed to all phases of ensiling. That's aerobic fermentation, storage, and feed out for minimum dry matter and nutrient losses. So it means proper stage of maturity at harvest, ensiling at the right moisture content or dry matter range content, chop length, pack, 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 cover as soon as possible, and do a proper feed out rate. So proper storage and feed out characteristics. And of course, cannot not say, always be safe. This is a, you know, a very dangerous job. So that's what it matters to say storage safety first. So again, thank you very much for listening. Uh, thanks, organizing committee. And I should be, I hope I am on the phone to entertain some questions or comments or anything. So again, thank you very much. Yeah, thank you so much, Renato. Uh, we've got a few questions coming in and a reminder to all of our attendees, if you've got questions, you can throw them either in the chat or in the Q&A feature. So Renato, in order to get the highest protein on triticale, what stage of the plant life cycle is the best time to cut? Uh, I think it's ideally you try to be before the reproductive phase. So before you start seeing the, you know, around like the heading at the latest, because when you start seeing the reproductive phase, then there is really like a very sharp drop on not only the crude protein, but also on the fiber digestibility. So this is something that uh, sometimes we don't, <clears throat> we don't pay much attention because, and, and even in the beginning, I would, I would say that, uh, I would refer to a protein crop when it was harvested at an earlier stage of maturity during the vegetative stage and more like an energy crop when we got, you know, the seed filling or with some little bit of a starch. And we do get like a little more energy, but then there's so much on the fiber digestibility that I wasn't really, you know, aware of, including also the crude protein. So I would try like to be just in the vegetative phase, like by, you know, early boot. Is there a big benefit to using a silage defacer as opposed to a loader bucket when you're at, at feed out trying to empty those bunker mm. silos? Uh, I think I would lean towards uh, a rake instead of defacer. And of course, both in my opinion would be more adventurous than the, the loader bucket, just because it's so hard to keep like a smooth area, a smooth face with the loader bucket. And it's almost like if you have a, uh like a plastic sheet and it's all wrinkled and you start to and you decide to stretch and then you see how much of a larger surface area it is so when it's all kind of like wrinkled the face it means that you have a lot more surface area for oxygen to penetrate now i mentioned that i preferred a little more the rake than the uh, defacer i think it's less like movable parts i think it's just easier to use the rake and this less, I think, you know, the time just to do everything. And it's, uh, you know, you get somebody that knows what they're doing. They, you know, they get pretty much the same result and you go a little faster and you don't have to worry too much on the maintenance and all the moving parts. Okay, thank you so much. Um, what is the recommended silage chop length at harvest and why? Uh, I think I might go that, you know, it, 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 it depends, <laughs> it depends on the crop, it depends on the variety. For example, we talk about, you know, corn silage, maybe a half an inch to three quarter of an inch. If it's a, a BMR hybrid, then you can go a little longer because you get more on that, you know, on the uh, NDFD and the rumination. 
if the material gets really dry, you have some uh, grass or some small grains and they're really dry, then especially the hollow steams, you might go a little, you know, you might have to go shorter just because you'll be a problem to pack. Um, our next question that's come in is, what crops would Buckneri inoculant be best used in? Uh, it could be used to anything. I don't recommend when the crop, I just, you know, I don't recommend when the crop it's too wet because normally when it's too wet, it will pack well and you shouldn't have issues with stability, feed out stability. 